This is Pico 8, a cute little virtual console that has all the tools you need to make a tiny 128 by 128 retro game. I've always wanted to try it out, but here's the problem. I suck at pixel art. I attempted it once, and this was the result. But you know who is good at pixel art? This guy, Reese Geo Fortnite. So I hit him up and asked him if he wanted to try and make a Pig 08 game together for the upcoming Brackies Game Jam. Hey Reese, we're making a game for the Brackies Game Jam, all right? Come on, man! I'm so busy with the Kickstarter and the game and just all of these things <laughs> going on right now. <laughs> Oh, I mean, yeah, for sure, man. Like, that's that's fine, I, I, I guess. All right, awesome. Thanks, dude. To understand what Pico 8 is, we're going to have to go back a few years. Hello. Welcome to the first tutorial done by Brackies. I am the CEO of Brackies. Uh, not that far back. You know the hardware limitations of video game consoles in the 1980s? You'd think those harsh restrictions were a bad thing, right? No. Some weird people enjoy the challenge of developing under retro limitations. Wait, what the f- what the f- So I'm dragging Reese along with me, and we're gonna learn Pig 08 in one week. I have to say, Pig 08 is pretty cool, but it's no core. Remember what I said about enjoying developing under limitations? Well, throw that out the window. Core allows you to build, publish, and play modern, ultra-quality games, and it's completely free. If you're new to making games, Core is a great way to start, especially if you want to make your own 3D multiplayer game. There's built-in networking and thousands of 3D art assets, as well as high-quality music and sounds. Coding is not required, but if you want, you can create your own game logic in Lua. You can build games from scratch, or remix and reimagine great content shared by other creators, like Jump Guys all the hassle of making a game, gone. And publishing your game is just as easy. All you have to do is click a button and it will instantly go live. Core also announced a 50% revenue share with top creators so you can make money with your games. Once again, Core is completely free, so be sure to check them out with the link in the description. Every game starts with an idea, or in our case, a bunch of weird drawings. It's not a game. <laughs> The theme for the jam was Stronger Together, which instantly reminded us of the leash mechanic from Murphy's Walk, the questionable game I showed off earlier. So what if we just took the leash and shoved it into another genre? We decided on a dungeon crawler where you independently controlled two players connected by a string that could kill enemies. I quickly put together a small prototype of our game idea. It was super simple to set up. Too simple even. And that's because the code looked like this. I realized pretty quickly that this approach was not going to work. There had to be some sort of solution for creating objects in Lua. And there was. Tables. Tables in Lua can store anything and everything, even functions. And by adding tables inside of tables, you can essentially have a list of entities with their own update and draw methods. So with this solution, I rewrote the prototype in a cleaner way that would be much more manageable. You can use a key to switch between players, and each player has a current direction that it moves in every half second, and this direction can be changed with the arrow keys, similar to Snake. Reese sent me some of the art he had been working on, and after adding it to the game, it was looking pretty cool, but there was no collision. So before a player moves, I check if its target position is a tile using a list of wall sprite numbers and pig awaits mget function, and if it is, I make them move in the opposite direction instead. Reese drew walk cycles for the players, so I created an animation system by just offsetting the current sprite of animated objects by a repeating global animation timer. Now it was time to add some challenge. Reese drew some spikes, and I made them kill you. Just like with the walls, I store each spike's sprite number in a table, so for each number in that table, I reset the players if either one collides with the sprite of that number. Then wait, what's that? Now it's time for enemies. 
Starting off, we have the runner enemy. Then we have the runner enemy, but faster. The winged enemy. The winged enemy, but faster. Then we have the turret enemy that shoots bullets, the double turret enemy that shoots two bullets, and the rock enemy. It does nothing. It's a rock. So the way these enemies work is pretty simple. They all share some common data. They each have an X and Y position so that in the player table's update method, I can easily call a method to kill the player on collision with any enemy regardless of the type. And similarly, each enemy's update method calls a function to check collision with the line between the players. I basically had to make my own line renderer, but instead of drawing a pixel at each pair of coordinates, I save them to a table. Then I can just check if the enemy coordinates are colliding with any coordinate in that table. Luckily, I had written a line renderer before for one of my Nintendo DS games, so I just, you know, borrowed that code. But each enemy has their own table that stores their unique data and behaviors. The runner enemy moves in either a vertical or horizontal line and changes directions when it reaches a wall. The winged enemy always moves toward the player. If it's above the player, it moves down, and so on. The bullet also counts as an enemy, it just moves in the direction it's told to and destroys itself after touching a wall. The turrets just create bullets at certain intervals using a turret timer, and the rock enemy doesn't need anything extra. It's a rock. Now that we had most of the mechanics implemented, Reese and I drew out the designs of each level. But before putting these in the actual game, there were a few final mechanics I had to implement. First, I created a level system. Basically, when drawing tiles or checking any collisions, I offset the tile map by the current level multiplied by the screen width. And for things like enemies, I have a method that clears each entity list and creates objects at certain positions based on the current level. This ended up being kinda tedious when actually implementing the levels, but it was good enough. For each level, a flag should appear once all the enemies are killed that lets you move on to the next level. So when the table of enemies is empty, I spawn the flag object that when collected increases the current level value and calls a reset method. And if you clear a level without dying, you can also collect a heart which adds to a heart counter at the bottom of the screen. Then I added breakable walls that get destroyed on collision. When colliding with a wall, I check if the wall should be breakable, and if it is, I use Pig08's mset command to replace the tile with an empty one. I also created a lock and key mechanic that works similarly. If you collide with a wall, I check if it's a chest and if the player has collected a key, and if so, I remove the chest and spawn a coin at its position. Collecting this coin also adds to a counter. Like hearts, this adds some optional challenge in hopes of catering to the elite gamer audience. Now we just had to move all of our levels to the actual game. Reese created all the layouts in Pico 8's tile map editor, and I wrote code to spawn all of the enemies and other objects at their correct positions for each level. This was super tedious. By the time we were done, it was 3am, two hours before the jam's deadline. Luckily, there wasn't much else to do. Reese designed a sick pixel art logo that I used to make a title screen, then I made an end screen that shows the amount of hearts and coins you collected. Only real gamers will get the true ending. Reese fell asleep on our Discord call. So I exported a web build and submitted it to the jam, and the next morning we cleaned up our itch page. Usually when jumping to new tools and frameworks, I'm never able to make anything... good? But I think I'm improving, which is pretty exciting. Being in a team also definitely pushed me to make a game a lot more in-depth than my usual... endless runners. So shout out to Reese Gayoffroy. Make sure to subscribe to his channel, link in description, and stay tuned for his upcoming Kickstarter. He also made a video on his perspective of the jam if you want to check it out. And if you want to check out the game, it's also linked in the description. You can apparently play it on a lot of different platforms. That's everything, so make sure to check out Core with a link in the description, and I'll see you in the next video.